Float with Henry Morgan. Jeffrey Hunter, anxious to save Henry Morgan from sailing into a trap, goes with Hero to the governor, Sir Thomas Motford. Between them, they piece together what really happened on the night that the Aztec necklace was taken. Sir Thomas is anxious to know how Geoffrey became a convict. Geoffrey tells him that it was the innocent dupe of a man named Glegg who later arrived as a convict at the island and who denounced him to Kitty. Sir Thomas warns both Geoffrey and Hero that he has no option but to retake them into custody and he puts them on their honour not to try to escape. Dolores, together with Dietz and Kitty, still a prisoner, arrives in Cuba and Dietz is well rewarded for his work, and plans are made to capture Morgan. Eventually, Sir Thomas returns to Geoffrey to tell him that Glegg has confessed that Geoffrey is innocent, and so he is pardoned. Due to the good work Hero has done, he too has given his freedom. A sloop is about to leave Port Royal to overtake Morgan and his fleet, and Sir Thomas tells Geoffrey that he is to join her. I can't express to Thomas the feelings I have. Without doubt, this must be the happiest day of my life. You are prepared to join the sloop? Join her? Why, a hundred fighting men couldn't keep me away. Our two don't know what to say, boss. When I left my home way back in Africa, I never thought I'd see a free day again. Lord, I thank you for letting the sun shine so bright. My heart is so full of happiness, my, my tongue is just dripping over itself. I'd like to go down on my knees and thank you for all that you've done. That will not be necessary. I realize that if you'd not stayed by Geoffrey Hunter and nursed him back to health, Morgan wouldn't have been warned. He's not warned yet. And he has a good start. But the sloop is fast. With the very good wind behind you, you have every chance of overtaking him. The sloop sails in an hour's time. An hour? Good. We want to waste no time. I dare say there's quite a lot you've to do. You want some money to set yourself up? Some new clothes? Yes, I... I hadn't thought of that. Well, I'll give you what you need. But you better hurry. You've not much time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Thomas. There's nothing to thank me for. Your case was a miscarriage of justice. You'll be compensated for the humiliation to which you've been. Hearing my name is all the compensation I want. You ain't saying goodbye to me, are you, boss? I ain't got no place to go now. Freedom to an old Negro like me means a lot, but, but it's an, like a new world I, I've been put into. I'm a bit bewildered. I don't want to say goodbye to you, Master Jeffrey. I ain't forgotten you saved my life. I ain't forgotten that you treated me just as if I was a white man and not just a bit of black trash and, and then things I ain't never going to forget. I don't want to say goodbye. You're going away on the ship. Maybe I'll never see you again. I'd rather be back as a slave and have you as my master. i would never do, Hero. And there's no reason why you shouldn't go on helping me. What do you mean by that? I had no thoughts of saying goodbye. True, I'm going away on a ship, but I took it for granted that you'd be coming with me. You want me to go with you, Mr. Jeffrey? Oh, Lord, I, I thank you for being so kind to me. Thank you for keeping me by my friend. You want me to come with you. I'm telling you, Master Jeffrey, that there's one person you ain't never gonna lose now. No, sir. You're taking me away with you on the ship. Hallelujah. I go down on my knees and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, come on, you black skelly. Wake up on your feet. None of that nonsense. Of course you're coming with me. And we'll have to move pretty fast. You want to catch that sloop. When I return, Kitty, to find you dressed in the fine clothes that I brought you. What are you doing still in those filthy rags you're wearing in Jamaica? I want none of your clothes, and I want none of you. So keep your distance, dear. And they told me you had not looked over your fine house that I bought you. And I don't want to see it. 
I'll ask you to leave me be. <laughs> are you not forgetting, Kitty, that you are not in a position to make demands of me? In Jamaica, when you were at the Dolphin Tavern, you were a bonded servant, a little better than a slave. But here in Cuba, you're not even that. You are my property. I do with you as I will. Don't you come near me. I hate you. <laughs> I'm glad to see your spirit is not gone. I was beginning to think you had become a milk and water woman. Now, don't become that, Kitty, because if you did, then I would soon grow tired of you. And when I grow tired of you, I'll not want you about me, and then, of course, I'll have to get rid of you. For your own sake, you'd best remember, always make yourself interesting to me. And now, enough of this nonsense. Dress yourself in the fine clothes that I brought you. Appreciate the fine home you're living in. I'm a man of wealth now. I'm going to be a man of position. Look what I'm giving you. Don't you appreciate it? Isn't it better to be here with me than a slave in a filthy dockside tavern? I'd rather be a slave in a dockside tavern than living with you. <laughs> Have you not yet learned that anger heightens your beauty? It makes you glow with life. I've been a very patient man, but now my patience is at an end. Don't you come any closer to me, Dirks. I'll have nothing to do with you. And don't you put your hands on me. And who is there to stop me, eh? This is not the Dolphin Tavern, Kitty, when you could scream and have the men coming to your aid. There is no one in Cuba to help you. No one, no one at all. Open your so lovely throat and scream. Scream loudly. It will bring you no aid from those who hear you. <laughs> it will only bring to their faces a, a knowing smile. And Kitty knows that what he says is true. There is no one. She is helpless. As helpless as a jungle-colored butterfly which has fluttered unsuspectingly into the enmeshing, sticky strands of a spider's web. But to give without a fight is against all her nature. She is conscious of the fact that her anger has heightened her beauty, has made the hot blood pound in Dietz's head finally burst the dam of his impatience. Her heart pounds within her. Her mouth slowly opens. Her small white teeth close over her lower lip. She looks searchingly into his face. It grows large before her eyes. Horrible, vicious, leering. It fills the orb of her vision. Fascinated with horror, she lets him put forth his hands to grasp her. But the shock of the cruel, deep-digging fingers snaps the bond which paralyzed her. Like forked lightning playing around the trees, she becomes a live, squirming, fighting thing. Reserved and hidden strength, born of desperation, surges through her. But Dietz's strength is even greater. A sloop noses out around the headlands of Port Royal Bay as daintily as a dancer. It skirts the reef over which the ocean's swell breaks into a feathery white surge. Quietly, the steady wind fills the canvas so that the ship seems like a white cloud being strangely guided over the deep blue sea. A long, lean, narrow bow dips down to cut through the rolling sea, then rises proudly up to meet the next swell. And the coast of Jamaica steadily recedes behind the pathway of swirling wake the ship leaves. Up on deck, the trade wind plays chasing among the gold of Jeffrey's hair, gently caressing his cheek, and his eyes search wide over the expanse of sea, looking out to that point where the two blues merge to make the distinct line which is the horizon. But his happiness is clouded. The memory of a face is before him, and a trust which he didn't fulfill. It was not my fault. My failure was beyond my control. But the inner voice will not be still. Kitty has showed to him that she had complete trust that he would rescue her. And now... Now she's gone to a life of... But I won't think of that. I must not have her go mad. I'll think of Henry Morgan in the morning I must give him. I pray this wind will hold and we'll be able to overtake him. And the wind does hold. And day makes way for night. Stars pop their cold, centuries-old light out from their cushion of blue, deepened almost to black. Like diamonds in the hair of a raven beauty, they winkingly look down. Then their brilliance fades before the white, waxing moon 
which climbs from out of the sea like a Dutch cheese which has been bounced slightly out of form. As though in a new world of strange beauty, the sloop cuts through the ocean, its night lights bobbing like fireflies, the moon reflecting in the wake, making a dancing silver lane, while the wind, gentle yet strong, fills the curved spreading canvas. Over the arch of heaven moves the Lady of Night, chased by coming day. Gently she sinks to abdicate to her lord, the king of the kings of the heavens. Bright and red and full of life, he sweeps majestically into the sky. And the wind still holds steady and firm. The circle of time repeats itself again and again, till the days run into a week. Curacao, Windward Island, Trinidad, all are past. Faintly, the coastline of South America lurks just on the edge of the horizon, like a thin, indistinct black pencil smudge. South and further south sails the sloop. It passes into that stretch of ocean which turns from depthless blue into a strange, muddy brown, caused by the mighty Amazon spewing forth its waters into the sea. Through the muddy waters, out into the blue once again. High up in the masthead, the watch is ever searching for the small fleet which is known to lie ahead. And behind the sloop, miles and miles astern, well out of sight, sails another fleet, proudly bearing the flag of Spain. But the watch is looking ahead, not astern. And then, there is a shout. Sails ahead! There is a rush for the sails. Voices jabber, fingers point, hand shield sunlight from eyes. And then away in the distance of the ships, looking small like pocket handkerchiefs. And the coast of South America begins to loom large and take shape. Cleaving through the rollers, the sloop draws near, and Morgan, aboard the flying gull, views it with suspicion. They're flying the English flag, but we're in enemy waters. Have all guns trained on her. Nearer comes the sloop, and Morgan, a glass to his eye, watches the longboat lowered and put out towards the flying gull. <laughs> that man in the stern. Can I believe my eyes? By St. David, it is. Yes, it's Hunter. That's I have a guard ready to give my visitors a welcome. What game does Jeffrey Hunter think he's playing? The moment he comes aboard the flying gull, I shall see that he's placed in irons. And then, Patch Eye, you can lock him below. I'll deal with him when I'm ready. Jeffrey Hunter had not realized that this would be his reception. It is imperative that he makes Captain Morgan listen to him and believe his story. Will they meet in the next episode of Afloat with Henry Morgan? Henry Morgan.